In the coming November election, all 67 state Senate seats will be on the ballot. Currently, the Senate Republicans hold the majority with 35 seats. A few weeks ago, I spoke with Senate Minority Leader Susan Kent. This week, I spoke with Senate Majority Leader Paul Gazelka about the priorities of his caucus. The most pressing concern for lawmakers before priorities and policies is the projected budget deficit facing the state. The latest numbers from Minnesota Management and Budget show that expenditures are expected to exceed revenues by $4.7 billion in the next biennium. How does this information shape caucus priorities? Well, it's actually alarming because uh, you have to add to that the shortfall that we have right now, and it's actually over $6 billion when you, when you do it that way. And so it, it should remind everyone, so the legislative branch and the executive branch, that you have to tighten your belt. I mean, I, I was through one of these in 2011, and it was extremely difficult. And so, you know, we'll be looking at, frankly, how, do we, how are we more efficient with what we do in government? Tax cuts are often a priority for your caucus. Are tax cuts off the table because of the projected budget deficit? Well, I think tax cuts stimulate an economy, but you know, one thing, frankly, we've been looking at right now is something called Section 179. It helps the ag community and small businesses to deduct expenses up front. That's the kind of thing that we should still be looking at so that they, you know, they, they invest more, which means they create more jobs and more opportunities. So they're not off the table, no. Okay. Um, your caucus in the last few years tackled housing affordability, looking for ways to roll back unnecessary regulations and to improve home ownership. Because of the pandemic and related job losses, one could argue that affordable housing is more important than ever before. Are there ways, despite the budget shortfall, to increase housing affordability? You know, the simplest thing is, is not to overregulate, and that's all housing. That's the small house and the big house. You know, I've been to other states and I can't, I can't believe how inexpensive a home is there versus Minnesota. And so we have to look at what are the things that we regulate. I know compared to Wisconsin, our cost to build is dramatically higher. And so this is the time that we should now be looking at that. You know, and we also have been doing housing bonds to help create more affordable housing. But the biggest thing I think we could do long term is, is to correct the overregulation. Addressing the high cost of health care and prescription drugs has also been a priority for your caucus. Uh, does it remain so? And in what areas might there be further improvement? Yeah, this is one that I think will be around for a long time. You know, reinsurance was something that we did that allow, allowed us to stabilize the health insurance market in Minnesota. We now have the lowest cost for health insurance premium around the country. Uh, think about what we did for insulin, that we provided emergency fly, supplies for that. Uh, we reformed the benefit manager, that's the middleman on prescriptions, to, to be more accountable. Uh, its work is never done on this, uh, but what we won't do is we won't go to uh, one care, is what the governor calls it, for, for Medicare for all, or some form of completely government-run health care. We don't think that's the direction, but... We have to bring more competition uh, and more innovation because this is a, a major expense for most families. And how has COVID-19 shaped your views on healthcare? And, and has it? Has it at all? Yeah, one silver lining is we do way more telemedicine. We do more, way more Zoom calls. Uh, and that has, is, will help drive down the cost of insurance, uh, but it will also make medical care more accessible everywhere. And so we're all figuring that out, but with the, the technology and the cameras that, that film so accurately now, we really can do a lot with telemedicine and we, we uh, made it easier because of COVID. That was a, a national drive, but it really has helped in Minnesota. Um, as you know, child care providers were already struggling, um, particularly in rural areas before COVID-19. Since COVID-19, uh, I imagine it's, it's even more challenging. Can the legislature do more to assist child care providers, especially in those rural areas where services have been difficult to attain? Yes, and a lot of that has to do with making it very difficult for the small mom, pod, a daycare provider. Uh, we've put on so many regulations. Again, regulations in Minnesota have crippled their ability to function. So many people just said, it's not worth it. I don't want to do it. So that's a big area that we can help 
we did uh, listening groups all across the state and that was probably the number one issue they talked about is you make it so difficult for us to be able to watch our neighbor's kids while they're working or doing whatever else they're doing. So that's probably number one. We do need to crack down and we did on, on the fraud. You heard the child's care assistance program where there was a, abuse of that. We, we made good progress there, but you know, those two things uh, are, are things that we've done and I think we'll continue to work on this area because it's a very, very important need for many families. This fall under guidelines set by the Minnesota Health Department, school districts will open in a variety of ways depending on you know, the level of infection with the coronavirus. There's in-person, there's a hybrid approach, and then there's also distance only learning. Potentially this fall, more and more schools may have to go to the distance only model due to the coronavirus. Education spending is already a significant portion of the state budget. Will schools have the support, both financially and in terms of infrastructure, that they need in order to educate kids as we continue in this uncertain time? Well, first of all, I think it's a big mistake that we are setting up a system that many high schools in particular aren't going to be able to have their kids in, in school. Uh, school is essential for our kids. And I think it's like one person under age 20 has died from COVID in Minnesota. It's not a problem for our kids, and, but, but not getting a good education is a major problem for our kids. And so I'm gonna continue to push to get all kids back in school, but with the, the, uh, the metrics that they have put out there, it's almost impossible for many schools to have a high school. And so, and I think COVID cases will rise in the fall. That's sort of what happens with other viruses. And if that happens and all the schools are shut down again, our kids will fall behind. So that's number one is we gotta get kids back in school. There's no other option that I see as acceptable. And then as far as resources and, and, and how we fund that, we have put in large amounts of, of dollars for education over the last number of years. Uh, when we, we're going to have an ec economic downturn, we're all going to have to figure out how to live with the resources that we have, and that will be tough. This next year will be very, very difficult. If we're $6 billion short or $8 billion or whatever the number, it will be a very challenging year. Um, the legislature recently passed a police reform bill to improve accountability in policing and hopefully to prevent another death like that of George Floyd. Are there other areas in the criminal justice system that require reform? You know, we're, I, I said that we would keep an open mind and, and look at uh, any of the issues that we couldn't get to during this uh, uh, police accountability bill that we passed. And so we'll do hearings on some of those other issues. Uh, but I, I am proud of the bill that we actually did. Uh, all of the groups came together in the end and said, this is good, all of them. Uh, some said it was not enough, but but it was something that we were, were very proud of. Uh, and, and at the same time, we, we did not, uh, um, we, we felt like the police were doing a good job, but that we had to figure out a way to uh, pluck out a bad apple here or there. We needed to make sure that we had more citizen input. We really wanted them to have input, but we still wanted the police to run the, the police board, not somebody else. And so uh, it was very, very good, but it's, it's in fact amazing how much we got done in the special session. But you know, we're, we're not done there. We'll do the hearings and see if we have more to do. And finally, before we go, as you know, the Department of Corrections recently announced the closure of two small correctional facilities to help address a budget shortfall. Is this a good move? And is this the kind of budget trimming that may be necessary to have that balanced budget in the next biennium? So this, I think, was the first one that they actually did to reduce spending. It probably would have been the last one for us. We just feel like public safety is, is, is the most important of all the things that we can do. Uh, back in April, I said that the, the governor should be cutting each agency 5%. If you go back to 2011, when we had a shortfall, they all did that internally because they knew they had to do it. They didn't tell us where they were saving the money. They just did. Had we done that, we would save $100 million every month. And so think about from April to next year, that's a, you know, a billion dollars or more that we could have saved. Other states have been doing this. Other states have cut five to 10% off of every agency. Why we have not, uh, I don't have an answer for, but as we're moving into next year and we get the numbers, that's what we'll, we'll see where we're gonna be. The other big disappointment 
the disappointment is man management and budget said that they were going to do a forecast in August to take another snapshot about where we are. Are we, how bad is it? Well, they've decided not to do that now. And I don't know if that means it's really bad or, you know, we'll see. But the next snapshot, if they don't change that position, is in November and and we'll see but I, I i do expect it to be difficult and that's why i, I wish the the government governor and his agencies would all reduce spending five percent now senate majority leader paul gazelka it's always so nice to talk to you thank you for your time today you bet